to the weekly research seminar. Today, uh, our own president, Professor Eric Singh, is going to give a talk. Uh, mm, Professor Eric is also a, a affiliate with the computer science department at the Carnegie Mellon University. He's also the founder and chairman of uh, Patoon IMC, uh, a 2018 World Economic Foreign Technology pioneering company that builds standardized artificial intelligence development platform and operating systems for broad and general industrial AI applications. He completed his PhD in computer science at the UC Berkeley. His main research interests are the development of machine learning and statistical methodology and large scale computational system architectures for solving problems involving automated learning, reasoning and decision making in artificial, biological and social systems. Professor Eric Singh is also a board member of the International Machine Learning Society. He has also served as the program chair and general chair for the International Conference of Machine Learning. So today he's going to talk about um, the topic about uh, towards a standard equation for machine learning with all experiences. If you have a question in the middle, a uh, quick clarification question you can ask. If you have a longer question, uh, please wait until the end of the presentation and we will have a standard uh, uh, Q&A session. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Eric uh, for giving this research seminar. Thank you, Eric, if you can. Go Great. Ahead. Thank you, Professor Le, for the introduction. Uh, everybody can hear me clearly? Yes. Great, yeah. Well, I'm so happy to uh, have this opportunity to give a regular research seminar as a professor, as a faculty here. And uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to give uh, uh, you a, uh, a, a quick intro about uh, one of the research topics that I've been working on uh, recently with my current and the previous students. Uh, but uh, of course, I'm going to mention also briefly in this context, uh, some of my other uh, additional research. And the goal is to really, you know, uh, you know stimulate uh, discussions uh, and uh, additional follow-up research, you know, in our community here. And also to, you know, together build, uh, you know, a more uh, open and vibrant research culture. So as uh, Le just mentioned, the topic is toward a standard equation for machine learning with all experiences. Uh, and I'm going to motivate the problem you know, from uh, the current challenges we have in machine learning. Uh, this talk uh, is uh, in collaboration with many of my former students and postdocs, but I want to mention one of them, you know, Dr. Jitun Hu, who is uh, going to be an assistant professor at the University of California at San Diego. And uh, he actually made uh, the fundamental and the majority of the you know, groundwork you know, in the materials I'm presenting today. All right, so why this problem is interesting. Uh, as we know that you know, machine learning these days and AI as well is uh, being uh, expected to solve a lot of problems. You know, here are just examples of this universe of problems. Right? You know, we are using machine learning AI to uh, study you know, biological molecular structure and to read uh, information from radiological images to uh, you know, uh, implement uh, self-driving cars that can recognize uh, objects on the street and make decisions accordingly. Uh, we use them to do machine translation, do text analysis and so on, right? So this myriad of uh, questions, you know, are uh, first of all signified by the variety of uh, data that uh, uh, they are generating and also the kind of data we need to analyze. And here are just some examples of uh, such data and experiences. They are very diverse. And uh, first of all, you know, what immediately come to our mind might be different types of data, you know, image, text, uh, you know, a time series, graphs, and so forth. But uh, in addition to such data examples, we also have other forms of experiences or you know, maybe a more advanced type of data or information, such as constraints. Now, there are many different uh, rules that one can use to further augment, you know, our machine learning AI systems. This rule can be come from a knowledge graph, can come from textbook or just domain expertise. And if your agent 
is uh, interacting with the environment uh, in a uh, real-time fashion, then you also have uh, another type of experience known as the reward, such as you know, whether you win scores or achieve certain tokens when you play a game you know, uh, with uh, an a adversary. And sometimes you may also even have uh, what we know as the, uh, the spar agents or auxiliary agents, which are co-trained with you you know, to uh, produce uh, certain feedbacks on your action or on your decision. And in other cases, we may collect adversary experiences where you, know, you have uh, an agent you know, working against you to uh, defeat your algorithm or, or compromise your solutions. And these are, again, a type of experience you know, our machine learning agents also often, often faces. And of course, uh, not the least, we are going to have combinations of all that, which means uh, any subset of uh, this can be presented together to a machine learning agent. Right? So this is the type of data and the experience environment of all kinds we are facing you know, as a machine learning and AI researcher in building our agents. Now let's look at uh, how human beings are handling these problems. You know, as a human being, we know that uh, we, first of all, uh, uh, deal with all these experiences daily and together. We're not basically dealing with only one type of experience at a time, right? We actually are very good at uh, solving all of them. And we have just one brain. And the, how we deal with that is actually still a mystery. Nowadays, we know there are all these kind of uh, building blocks, you know, in machine learning agents such as um, you know, typical classifiers. We use encoders and decoders to per, you know, process the uh, input information. We use transformers to build laser representations. And we have all sorts of uh, neural architectures or other solvers to make uh, different types of uh, decisions and predictions and so forth. Uh, is this the case for human brain? Do we also have all these different modules or building blocks in our brain to process information separately? Well, it is not known, but at least we know that the human can deal with all this experience uh, together as a single system. And that is already very different from uh, the current uh, machine learning system we are building. You know, for building a machine learning algorithm or machine learning system or solution, I guess many of you had this experience already. The first thing we need to deal with is uh, to pick the right uh, models you know, to uh, start processing the data. And there are different paradigms of such models. Right here, I give you just a few examples. Uh, we have this a big paradigm nowadays being popular, known as the neural networks. And there are many types of neural networks here. And uh, uh, one trend we can see already is that it's becoming bigger and bigger, right? And we already uh, moved away from uh, the classical convolution networks and now embracing BERT models, GPT models. And uh, recently, Google were talking about having the so-called trillion parameter models. So this is a paradigm that helps you know, uh, people building machine learning systems. And then we have the classical paradigms, uh, often known as the graphical models for very uh, multivariate modeling, and uh, including there uh, are Bayesian networks, microlearning fields. And they actually could be viewed as uh, a uh, uh, theoretically, mathematically more elegant and the well and the better understood version of uh, you know, network models. They are smaller than neural networks, but uh, they uh, are mathematically better understood. And uh, we used them before you know, to work on many problems. For example, hidden Markov model is one of these examples which are well studied. And then there are also you know, techniques rising from the uh, field of optimization, you know, such as the kernel machines. And there are many classical models, you know, decision trees, PCAs, and boosting methods, and so forth. So when you build machine learning uh, solutions, you have to be knowledgeable in this universe and uh, make the right choice of the models. And then once you make your choice of the model, you have to decide on uh, what algorithm heuristic you have to use to train those models. And typically, given data uh, examples, we uh, go to the maximum likelihood paradigm, but uh, very often when your experience becomes richer, such as uh, including rewards, after interacting with the environments, you may use a reinforcement paradigm to train continuously. And uh, there are also more modern training paradigms such as the GAM training paradigm, uh, 
revert in inverse reinforcement learning and so forth. Each of these uh, training paradigm sometimes evolve into a whole area of research, which uh, leads to many different algorithm innovations and all that. So it is again a vast space uh, of uh, a zoo of uh, models and algorithms for you to choose from. Now, when we built a specific uh, machine learning system, such as uh, this one that I used to work on in the in in, the, in my company, we want to build uh, a uh, you know a, uh, a machine learning uh, radiologist, a robot radiologist, which can read you know uh, radiological images such as X-ray pictures or CT pictures, and automatically generate a clinical case report, you know to. Uh, present diagnostic outcome and uh, clinical history and uh, some reasoning of the recommendation and so forth. And then this system can be very, very complex and involve multiple models and uh, multiple algorithmic solutions all the way down to building the correct system implementations to run them efficiently. And uh, you can imagine such a uh, problem can become very complex. And here I'm just you know, showing you a page uh, where I summarized, you know, all the uh, algorithmic and the model building blocks that was employed in building such a uh, robot radiologist system. Okay, you can see that there are already more than a dozen different names, you know, for uh, different building blocks, including, you know, uh, you know, bidirectional LSTM models, you know, for sequential, you know, data analysis, tree LSTMs for theoretical information processing, and then uh, you know, graph neural networks to encode you know, uh, some knowledge graphs uh, and uh, different uh, paratrain paradigms involving you know, uh, policy gradients and other reinforcement technique to really incorporate different uh, rewarding functions and scores and so forth. So that's actually getting you know, me to one of the talking points in today's talk. The problem is uh, really, really complex, as you can imagine. And uh, the space of solutions can be so large that it is uh, becoming really hard to navigate. It's like walking through this maze you know, to find the target. And depending on every individual's uh, domain expertise, training background, and so forth, and the level of creativity and the skills they have, you may land yourself at very different solutions. And these solutions are often, you know, uh, very, uh, you know, crafty, uh, very artistic, uh, artisanal maybe. And uh, it is really a, a best park solution that is uh, uh, like a dedicated piece of art rather than a uh, standardized, repeatable and reusable engineering solutions. And when you have to sometimes solve multiple problems of slightly different uh, kind of uh, uh, requirements and the different functions, then very often time you have to redo the exercise of building the solution again. And I sometimes joke with my colleagues and students. So this is like you know, building a, a full runway uh, to take off one type of aircraft. And then if you have a different uh, aircraft uh, of slightly different size and configuration, you may need to build another aircraft, right? So this is uh, what the machine learning nowadays uh, is uh, pretty much about. It's very different from uh, you know, uh, our real world engineering approach to problems like uh, aviation and uh, transportation and so forth. So, so what's the problem there? Why we are facing a different uh, world of uh, possible solutions and, uh, and the practices in machine learning and AI compared to many other fields? So what are those other fields look like? Well, I used to be trained as a physicist. I have to say that uh, I feel very fortunate to live uh, in the nowadays age of physics rather than the age that is, uh, let's say, 20, uh, two or 300 years ago, which actually look like uh, what AI looks like now. So this is the world of physics you know, in you know, the 18th century. Okay? At that time, uh, electricity and the magnetics were known as a two different phenomena, natural phenomena. And there were different theories built toward that such as, uh, for example, you all know the Ampere's law, the Coulomb's law of charge, uh, the, uh, the Ampere's law of, uh, of occurrence. And they are basically the theory underlying electricity. And then there are Faraday's law of induction, 
the Gauss law of magnetism and so forth, they are a different set of theory underlying magnetics. And uh, I'm not even mentioning other phenomena like, uh, you know, uh, for example, people study uh, the theory of light beams. And again, even for this uh, light beam, there are theories of, uh, there are particle theories and there are wave theories. And then there is a whole new set of theories uh, for the law of uh, gravity and so forth. So, so all these uh, physical phenomena, you know, are uh, viewed very differently and uh, derived by different equations. So as a physics major, if you want to do something creative, you have to be a master of all this and remember, I don't know, you know, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of different equations. And that's a very, very kind of a difficult uh, territory, you know, for person to navigate. Isn't that like what we are facing in AI nowadays, right? But uh, the world of physics changed quite a bit, you know, after generations of uh, uh, very visionary physicists. You know, for example, you all know, uh, you know, a very famous physicist known as uh, uh, Maxwell. He actually uh, took the effort to uh, review and uh, investigate all these uh, equations behind the electricity and the magnetism. And uh, he was able to, first of all, you know, uh, build a unified notational system to represent the electrical field and the magnetic field and the other constants in a very systematic manner. And then he was able to just summarize, you know, or rewrite all the equations from Gauss law, you know, from Faraday's law, Ampere's law and so forth, using this uh, new notational system and also write them along all different, uh, you know, uh, you know, physical dimensions, you know, in a 3D universe. And then, you know, expose some of the regularities, you know, of uh, uh, the relationship between electricity and magnetism to the point that uh, he concluded that uh, the electricity and the magnetism are just two sides of the single coin. They are belonging to a same physical phenomenon known as the electricity electromagnetism. Right. And then, you know, after, you know, uh, uh, introducing additional symmetry, such as uh, using the vector representation of uh, electrical field and the magnetic field, and also using rotational symmetry and so forth, this set of uh, Maxwell equations, which I think here amounts to 12 equations, can be further reduced into just four equations. Okay, and later on, when people study the special theory of relativity and introduce uh, more symmetries due to that, uh, you know, uh, 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 physical phenomenon, the set of equations can be further reduced into, you know, just two equations. So, so what's the big deal in here? What well, the big deal here is that uh, you can actually, you know, uh, use uh, uh, some insight to unify many of the seemingly disparate phenomena and the properties and the functions, you know, into uh, a same set of uh, mathematical functions, which actually expose some inner connectivities and also some uh, fundamental connections between all these seemingly different, uh, you know, phenomena, and that's actually very helpful, you know, in you know uh, leading the physics research and application forward. On the research front, you know, they leads to the eventual unification of uh, not only electricity but and the magnetism, but also you know weak force and strong force to the point that right now all natural force except gravity can be now unified under a single, you know, a set of, uh, you know, a mathematical function. And also on the engineering side, you know, there are scientists such as, uh, you know, Edison, Tesla, using this type of a uh, much simplified, you know, expression and, uh, and mechani uh, mechani uh, mechan uh, mechanisms to, you know, uh, productionize, you know, uh, electricity and magnetism so that uh, we can now, you know, use uh, just electricians you know, to uh, conduct the work which used to take, uh, you know, a, a whole knowledge of uh, the, uh, the, the, the physics of electricity. For example, right now to wire a house, you know, with electricity, you don't need to have electrician, a electrician who has a PhD in, uh, in physics, right? He just need to have a high school diploma and uh, with a training manual, he could pretty much know how to operate 
you know, very non-trivial, you know, wiring and uh, construction of, uh, you know, uh, for powering the house and so forth. And this is very different from uh, what we are facing in artificial intelligence. To do even a very trivial kind of function, such as, uh, you know, recognizing, you know, objects from a new set of images that is uh, not uh, uh, too familiar, you know, to, uh, you know, a previous, uh, you know, implementation. Uh, you'd better have a PhD in computer vision and know how to build uh, your neural networks uh, and tune them and tweak them to, you know, basically, you know, get uh, some initial results. And then also to study, you know, the algorithms behind, uh, you know, neural networks or graph models, you need to be a master, you know, of uh, uh, differential equations and the linear algebra probability, you know, to even understand that uh, sometimes uh, different notations, you know, in, in, in machine learning refer to the same thing. You know, I just name a few, you know, many of you probably know that uh, in neural network, we have uh, something called, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, say a decoder uh, or a encoder, right? And then in graphic models, we have something called a variational approximation versus a generative model. Very few people realize that they are actually the same thing, just with different names, right? And then we have also inferential networks, you know, encoding networks and the uh, inferential models, you know, in fact, all these actually uh, can be unified uh, under a same expression mathematically, but uh, right now there aren't too much uh, effort into such cleanup and unification. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is to uh, ask and try to answer the question that is there a blueprint for machine learning where we can, you know, bring you know uh, this uh, uh, very you know uh, divergent and the very uh, you know uh, messy uh, collection of uh, machine learning technique formalism and algorithm you know to something that is more ordered and uh, more unified so that uh, we can you know uh, hopefully you know uh, recognize some uh, unifying theme. And then, and also make our future uh, development and innovation a little bit easier. Right. So that basically is the, the question I'm going to ask: What's the blueprint of machine learning? And uh, usually, you know, for doing machine learning uh, implementation and the design, you need to address the following three dimensions: you need to come up with a loss function, you need to come up with an optimization solver for the loss function, and also you need to plug in different type of uh, model architectures to you know, uh, uh, perceive process data and to represent internal concepts. So I will begin with the loss function in addressing the blueprint uh, and the question for machine learning because uh, loss function is uh, really at the genesis of uh, most if not all machine technique. They you know, dictates you know, how data is uh, uh, evaluated you know, how algorithm, you know, can be designed and how solutions can be validated uh, and also, you know, uh, how, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, piece building blocks of uh, solutions, you know, can be connected to form a compounded solutions. So inside the loss function, I'm going to show you a equation that can be break down into clear components representing experience and divergence and uncertainty so that uh, we can you know, uh, bring some uh, standardization into the composition of this loss function. So I will start by uh, reviewing some of the historically uh, important and well understood loss functions to actually uh, inspire you know, a uh, uh, direction toward a standard equation expression. So let's take a look of uh, the maximum likelihood estimation as a close look, right? We all know this is uh, a very classical paradigm, uh, which uh, includes uh, a supervised version and a unsupervised version. And in the supervised version, MLE amounts to defining this loss function, which is uh, the expected, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the log likelihood, you know, taking expectation over examples. And uh, we want to find our parameters by minimizing this loss function, right? 
And uh, you know, once you have this loss and you have a objective, you can imagine algorithms you know, uh, such as a stochastic gradient can be deployed you know, to uh, iteratively you know, approach and uh, solve the theta for you. Right? And uh, in most cases, there isn't a closed form solution for the theta. Therefore, a gradient mechanism probably is uh, a, a very easy alternative for you to go. And then in the unsupervised learning setting, you know, the loss function can be uh, also, you know, expressed explicitly. But in this case, because you have latent variables, you have to take an integration, you know, inside the log function over the joint distribution of uh, both the observed data and the latent variable so that they become the likelihood. And then this uh, particular function, uh, the loss function uh, will be uh, more complicated than the supervised version because now you see you know, a, uh, you know, a integration form inside the loss, which uh, makes uh, the differentiation, you know, of, uh, you know, like a, by SVD, uh, by SGD, you know, over theta, you know, uh, rather computational than trivial. And then, you know, people invented uh, heuristics like an EM algorithm, which basically, you know, uh, iterates within two steps, right? In the E step, you do some kind of intuition of this latent variable Y, to make them observed. And therefore you reduce the problem back to a supervised problem. And then in the M step, you just do supervised machine learning. Right? So why this algorithm makes sense, right? It's heuristically very interesting and very intuitive, but mathematically, is there a clear way to understand that? And then how to improve you know, upon these type of algorithms to get better efficiency or how to uh, say uh, mitigate some of the computational difficulties due to the fact that maybe imputing the hidden variable may be too complex or taking the M step can be also very complex. So these are the questions which uh, really inspires generations of researchers, you know, to look into, you know, in a very, very, you know, uh, domain specific and kind a of context specific fashion, all these recent topics. And that actually is uh, what makes the machine learning study very difficult and, uh, and also uh, hard to penetrate. But uh, I want to suggest that uh, when you change an angle to look uh, into the problem in say even MLE, you may you know, have an opportunity to uh, reduce the complexity and, the broad, and, bring, and maybe uh, uh, bring up some, uh, uh, build up some solutions which can be generalized when you solve other problems. So this uh, new view is uh, known as uh, the maximum entropy view. So here, you know, I show a maximum entropy uh, representation of the MLE problem. So what you do is to define, you know, your target distribution P and uh, then instead of uh, maximize the likelihood, now you minimize the entropy defined over the P distribution subject to a constraint, which requires the expectation of, uh, you know, your uh, sufficient statistic under the target distribution to be equivalent to you know uh, the data expectation. Basically, you know the the empirical counts of your sufficient statistic in your data sets, right? So here you can see that while using the data in here as the constraint of the original distribution, okay, and the, this formulation will naturally lead to a closed form expression of uh, the target distribution if you assume the target distribution is an exponential family. So which gives you a typical exponential form and uh, then you can minimize, you know, uh, the resultant uh, likelihood function, you know, uh, and uh, get the theta estimation. Right. So this is uh, basically telling you that uh, the maximum entropy, you know, formulation of MLE is going to lead you to a uh, same solution to our original formulation. But uh, it actually leads you to even more insights when the problem becomes a little bit more complicated. For example, uh, what I just did is to take assumptions that P is a member of the exponential family. And therefore you have this uh, beautiful, you know, closed form expression of the solution. What if uh, you relax that assumption, right? So here, for example, let's take the most general assumption, which uh, only assumes structure and not, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, assume presence of structure in the model, but no parametric form assumption. So this is a Markov random field expression of a 
multivariate distribution where you have a product of the so-called uh, click potential functions. And uh, you actually uh, want to estimate these uh, potentials based on fully observed data. This problem is known to be quite difficult and the best kind of uh, represented using the following maximal entropy formulation where you just uh, minimize the KL divergence between the empirical distribution and the distribution you want to solve. And this formulation actually could lead to a very uh, interesting you know, uh, iterative program known as the IPF, the iterative proportional fitting, which actually exposed to you the following ideas. We are going to now optimize the potential function of uh, each clique iteratively. And each time your updated form of the clique potential is uh, a product of your old estimation times the ratio of your empirical marginal of the clique versus the expectation of the marginal on the clique. So this is a very, very insightful observation because now that means even if you are solving a estimation problem on fully observed data, you still need to compute the expectation okay, of a subset of random variables under the target distribution. And that's actually what the EM algorithm is trying to do. So this algorithm basically gives you the insight that uh, you know, the EM idea, the expectation and the maximization idea is not actually limited to only solving the unsupervised learning problem. In the fully supervised learning problem, you also need to use the EM idea in many you know, uh, non-trivial cases to achieve a solution. Therefore, you know, that's where the EM actually is uh, coming from. You need to actually you know, iteratively compute both you know, uh, you know, uh, the parameters and also the expectation of some subset of random variables for you know, certain computational purposes. Now let's see how this idea you know, moves on to solve more complex problems, such as the one in unsupervised ML. Right? In the unsupervised MLE, you, know, you are going to you know, uh, you know, uh, target or uh, aim yourself towards solving the so-called posterior distributions of hidden variables given the observations. And in here, you know, the maximal entropy formulation enables you to introduce another new idea that is going to be very useful, you know, especially in the nowadays neural network you know, uh, you know, research, which is known as uh, a auxiliary distribution that approximates the target posterior distribution of latent variables given data. So here, let's call it Q. So under the maximal entropy formulation, solving a unsupervised MLE is equivalent to minimize a lower bound you know, of uh, the likelihood and the lower bound is defined by you know, uh, the cross entropy between you know, your auxiliary distribution Q versus uh, the original distribution P and also a entropy of the Q itself. And the gap between the lower bound and the original uh, likelihood of the data is actually defined by the KL divergence between your auxiliary and also the target posterior. So this is again another very important insight because uh, it gives you one of the best uh, intuitive uh, uh, expression of the EM algorithm, as I'm going to show here. For example, here is uh, you know the EM idea toward uh, the supervised the unsupervised MLE, but now applied to the maximal entropy and, uh, and uh, formulation. In here, what the EM is trying to do is to iterate between these two steps. In the E step, what we are trying to do is to minimize this uh, gap. Okay, remember this is a gap between our you know, uh, original loss versus uh, the proximal loss you know, due to the, uh, the lower bound. And uh, our goal in the E step is to minimize the KL, this gap by you know, uh, setting the, 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 the auxiliary distribution you know, of uh, the uh, latent variable given observation to the older version of the posterior. So the older version of the posterior is known because uh, in the previous step of the EM, you already know the parameters. Therefore, you can compute the posterior distribution of uh, the latent variable given the data using then parameters. And now you set the current 
auxiliary distribution of the latent variable to be the old posterior. And then in the M step, you are going to plug in this uh, you know, uh, newly estimated auxiliary distribution into the cross entropy target of this loss and then minimize the theta, the parameters of the model against it. So that's basically why the EM step is the alternating between optimizing a auxiliary distribution and optimizing the parameters of the original distribution. In, in a sense, the EM idea is uh, a, uh, what we know as the alternating gradient step. We are doing optimization in two solution space, as I show you know, in this graph, right? You are now expanding you know, the original optimization problem from uh, optimizing only in the space of the theta, which is your original problem, into the space of uh, theta and the, or the auxiliary distribution of Q. And the, why this is interesting? Well, this is actually a algorithmic trick which allows you to solve the original problem easier. Imagine you are climbing a wall, you know, with uh, just uh, you know one face of the wall. You can imagine this is a very difficult climbing task because you have to hang on yourself, you know, every time to your previous version and go to the next step in the same space of theta. But the clever you know, climbers usually are leveraging on, you know, that is a crossing wall, you know, so that they can, you know, bouncing back and forth between the two walls to climb up. And this auxiliary space is now provided by the introduction of the QID. Right. So that basically, you know, returns to uh, what I originally uh, motivated. Using a maximum entropy idea, you suddenly opens up some design tricks, no design space where, you know, auxiliary tools such as a uh, approximating function to the posterior can be introduced to make your you know, optimization problem easier. Okay. And it can make the optimization problem more easier if you want to go even deeper this route to do further engineering and uh, manipulation of uh, the auxiliary tools. For example, you know, we all know that uh, in, uh, in deep learning, one of the frequently used tool is the called the variational auto decoder, right? So the variational you know, technique you know, has been often used in machine learning to approximately solve a estimation problem. So in here, we can see what variational EM is trying to do. In variational EM, what's happening is that people recognize this uh, auxiliary distribution Q, you know, if you don't control uh, the complexity can still get very complex. For example, the variational distribution Q of X, uh, Y given X can be, you know, uh, you know uh, a complex subgraphic model, which uh, is uh, still complex to estimate. But if you restrict the family of the Q to a, uh, say what they know is as a fully factorizable distribution, okay, and then suddenly the Q become easier to handle, right? So by restricting the family of Q for the auxiliary distribution, you get a approximation, you know, to the Q, and that's actually uh, the idea behind variation no EM. So in the E step, you are going to find a Q from a subspace, okay, that is easier than the original space is, okay, and the minimizing the KL over there, okay. This is different from uh, you know uh, solving the Q in the full space of all possible distributions, but only in a subspace of uh, computable and the easier distributions. And then in the M space step, you do the usual thing, right? In fact, variational EM algorithm or variational autoencoder is exactly a extension of this idea that uh, the space of uh, the approximation is uh, a encoder that allows you to uh, run, you know, approximation and the back propagation algorithm to compute, you know, a uh, approximation to the, you know, to the, you know, posterior distribution of the random variables given the bottom layer inputs. There are additional tricks to even go further. For example, one of the early day algorithm, you know, to solve a deep neural network is known as the weak sleep algorithm, you know, invented by Hinton, you know, a couple of decades ago. And the weak sleep algorithm was uh, also, you know, uh, known as a, a kind of a dirty heuristics that is uh, mathematically not very clear, but somehow worked, you know, in getting you a proxy solution to the original estimation problem. 
So what exactly weak sleep agreement is doing? In fact, what it is doing can be easily understood by this uh, maximum entropy formalism as well. Here is a story. So remember in the east step, we were trying to minimize the KL divergence between the auxiliary Q and the original posterior P, right? And uh, originally we defined the KL to be from Q to P, right? But uh, that's actually defining the true you know, gap between the loss function, the, the likelihood and also its lower bound. But uh, that KL formulation can be also very complex because you need to take expectation you know, of the P you know, over Q. And uh, what uh, uh, weak sleep acquisition is doing is to you know, make this computational step easier by reversing the direction of the KL so that now you are computing the KL from P to Q instead of from Q to P. And uh, that sometimes gives you a computational game where you can directly, you know, uh, you know, uh, parameterize this approximation and then run some uh, sub steps to make it uh, easy to compute. And then in the M step, you return to, you know, uh, you know, the estimation over uh, the optimization over, you know, the cross entropy and of Q and P over theta, right? So again, all these uh, steps now can be more easily understood, you know, by just looking into uh, deeper and deeper the maximum entropy formalism. So just to sum up, you know, this uh, maximum entropy view of uh, the maximum likelihood estimation helped us to unify, you know, all these uh, algorithmic tricks, SGD, IPF, EM, VEM, and uh, weak sleep under a same umbrella of uh, minimizing some entropic loss of the original learning problem. And also it has a very close connection, you know, to the optimization theoretic formalisms, which allows you to bring in approximate uh, uh, additional techniques as I'm going to introduce in a second. Yeah, so here is uh, some additional ideas that can also, you know, uh, empower further the maximum entropy uh, formalism. You know, for people who uh, worked in uh, Bayesian learning, you probably heard about this idea known as the posterior regularization, right? It is uh, one step beyond just simple Bayesian learning where you estimate uh, a posterior of the parameters given prior knowledges. In here, we are going to, you know, uh, you know, utilize uh, this formulation, which uh, allows you to estimate uh, a posterior distribution of the data under data-induced constraints, okay? In fact, this is a constraint that is uh, to allow features you used in parameter your model to follow uh, either uh, boundaries, you know, or other, uh, you know, uh, restrictions defined over data. If this constraint is removed, then this formalism will recover you the base loop. Okay. So this formalism is very important because in history of machine learning, people utilized it a lot to introduce uh, you know, uh, non-trivial constraints such as the margin constraints or structure margin constraints so that uh, your Bayesian learning can be fully integrated with ideas coming from support vector machines and other advanced structured graphic models. Okay. But uh, the trick here is to reformulate, you know, uh, the original probabilistic inference problem now into a constraint optimization problem using the idea of uh, maximum entropy inspired loss function and also optimization theoretic inspired constraint functions. And uh, using this, you actually don't have to only restrict yourself into Bayesian learning you can go beyond just estimating a posterior distribution of the hidden variables. You can actually use it to estimate the entire model, okay, not necessarily the posterior. And then your constraint can be, you know, beyond just uh, instance-based constraint, but also rule-based constraints, as we showed earlier in one of these papers. But at the end of the day, this formalism is going to give you another clean solution that very much look like the EM formulation we saw before from the acquismic perspective. In the E step, we're going to solve this uh, auxiliary function Q. And here is the closed form solution by using the Lagrangian technique. You can see that it exposes you the core idea in Bayesian learning that you have a combination of the prior distribution uh, with uh, new information coming from the constraints and then normalized properly into you know, a posterior. And then in the M step, 
you are going to use this to estimate a new set of parameters and then iterate, right? In fact, you know, our earlier unsupervised maximum likelihood estimation could be reformulated as a, as a special case of the posterior regularization by just uh, you know, uh, instantiating this uh, data-driven constraint to be just instance constraints. If you see the data, you have a data function taking value one, otherwise you push them to be zero. And then this posterior regularization reduces to maximum likelihood estimations. So why I'm spending the effort here to explain all these uh, different uh, classical algorithms and uh, revisiting the maximum entropy formulation on the arm. Well, the goal is to hopefully help us landing at uh, a generic formulation, which we call the standard equation. So here we have uh, the following optimization problem, uh, which uh, can be equivalently uh, written as a unconstrained optimization problem by using the Lagrangian multiplier to bring in the constraints into the master equation. Okay. So this is uh, a standard equation that consists of the three uh, the following three components. The first part, which is uh, taking the form of a expectation of uh, feature functions over a auxiliary distribution of uh, the model is uh, referred to as the experience functions. They can be the vehicle to carry information coming from data, rules, and many other forms of experiences as you will see in a second. And then the second component is known as the divergence function it basically leads to a mechanism that uh, force, you know, the iterative, uh, you know, convergence uh, between the auxiliary Q distribution and the, our target P distribution that we want to learn. And the, the, and the, the divergence can be, you know, a cross entropy, but also can be other form of divergence, such as, uh, you know, jensen sandon divergence and other divergence functions. And this term is very critical in, you know, uh, enabling the so-called teacher-student mechanism to iteratively bring, you know, uh, the teacher function closer to the student function using a EM style formulation. And then the last component is known as the uncertainty term, which controls the internal complexity, you know, of uh, the auxiliary function to prevent, you know, uh, degeneracy and other uh, EO behaving mathematical behavior. Okay, so this is, you know, to sum up what I called the master's equation or the standard equation, which uh, naturally subsumes many of uh, the earlier well-known algorithms to be its special cases. We already see a few examples such as the maximum likelihood, such as uh, the, uh, the posterior regularization. And let's see how this algorithm or this uh, standard equation by instantiating the experience, the divergence and the uncertainty in different ways leads to more algorithms. We saw this already, right? In the unsupervised learning setting, you can set the feature function to be an indicator function, and then you are going to rec uh, recover fully, you know, what is known as the maximum likelihood estimation in the fully unsupervised setting. But, uh, you know, this is just the, maybe the most trivial form of data experiences which, in which uh, the data are either given or not given, and you are going to take it or not taking it. In modern learning paradigm, we may uh, think about uh, some fancier data experiences. For example, there is a type of data experiences known as the Oracle data experience. Imagine that uh, you are the trainee and uh, you are not satisfied with just passively receiving data, but you would uh, ask the teacher to give you the kind of data you want. For example, you feel a particular example to be difficult for you to understand, and then you ask for more such examples. And then for other uh, data points, which are considered to be easy, say closer to the decision boundary, uh, further away from the decision boundary, you may ask the teachers to stop giving you or giving you just a few. Right. So this is basically what is known as the Oracle data experiences. You can draw data from, you know, a Oracle function. And, uh, you know, you're, this actually is the typical setting uh, known as uh, active learning. And there used to be a whole field of uh, active learning, you know, uh, designing specialized models and algorithms, you know, for handling that kind of uh, learning task. But under the standard equation, all you need to do is to redefine 
your feature functions, okay? You can basically plug in your feature function to be like this, which is uh, now, you know, uh, incorporating both the data instances and a Oracle that you can arbitrarily design and then plug this uh, F function into your standard equation. And suddenly you will see that uh, by plug into, you know, uh, this uh, standard equation and uh, go through the usual EM step, you recover, you know, the algorithm which was uh, discovered earlier, you know, in some, you know, very, uh, you know, fundamental papers, you know, for active learning. And in here, you basically just, uh, you know, uh, mechanically recover those algorithms with uh, little effort. Let's look at another example. Now let's see uh, some new experiences such as uh, in the reinforcement learning setting, right? So the, the task of reinforcement learning is to uh, work with uh, uh, a new type of data known as uh, the experiences, you know, uh, interacting with the environment. And typically you have a state action, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, distribution, uh, which allows you to uh, produce actions conditioning on what state you are having. And this is known as a policy function. And then by applying this action to the environment, you basically can uh, receive a reward and which uh, can be, you know, either uh, given or modeled, right? So now let's imagine that uh, we set uh, such a reward function to be our experience in here. And then uh, plug them back into our standard equation. And also we redefine our auxiliary distribution you know, to be the posterior of the hidden states, which are the actions given the, uh, the, 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 uh, the states, and also you know, the state distributions you know, uh, in the environment, make them you know, a new auxiliary function. And once you finish this definition and plug all this into the standard equation, you actually can immediately recover what is known before as uh, the inverse reinforcement learning algorithm, okay, reported in these papers. Again, you know, a simple plug-in and the redefinition of the feature function recovers you previously, you know, uh, well-developed algorithms without additional effort. You can actually use the same equation to, you know, uh, recover uh, more advanced algorithms. For example, in the same reinforcement learning setting, instead of uh, you know uh, utilizing the reward function directly as experiences, now you can take a logarithm of that reward function and uh, define them as a log experiences, and again plug them back into the standard equation. And this time you are going to recover a algorithm equivalent to what is well known to be the policy gradient algorithm. Again, no additional derivation is needed. You just uh, plug in and recover naturally the mathematical formulation equivalent to a previously well-known algorithm. So now I've talked quite a few instances of how to instantiate the experience function. What about uh, the divergence function? That's also up for you to instantiate in different ways. So for example, we notice that uh, you know, we can replace you know, the, uh, the divergence function in here you know, to be uh, a... Uh, jensen shannon divergence. Okay, so this is a divergence function that measures uh, the Q and the P, you know, uh, in, a, uh, in a specific manner, different from uh, what was originally used to be the cross entropy. And it turns out that once you plug in this uh, new loss function or divergence function into the standard equation, you need to, you can solve it using a technique known as uh, the probabilistic functional descent that leads you to, you know, uh, you know, deriving, you know, what is known as the inference function using a convex duality technique. Okay, and once you go this far, you actually will be asked, you know, to uh, introduce a parametric form of, uh, you know, the uh, the inference function. And uh, typically, people could, uh, you know, uh, naturally plug in, you know, a discriminator that is. Uh, defining you know, uh, uh, the loss of the influence function like this. And uh, the discriminator will be making use of, uh, for example, a neural network you know, that uh, makes a classification of the data examples that uh, you, know, uh, you generate from the model. And uh, just by making all these plugins, it turns out that your final loss function 
okay, under the standard equation is a minimax formalism that is equivalent to the vanilla generative adversarial network model developed a few years ago. Okay, so this is a purely coming out of uh, you know uh, a standard equation you know defined on a specific uh, divergence loss function and a specific form of uh, the influence function to solve this divergence function without basically you know thinking about the generative adversarial mechanisms behind it right so it's very mechanical and then you can actually also you know uh, you know uh, take advantage of uh, you know the fact that you can design freely and uh, openly all sorts of experiences so in here you can further define this uh, experience function f to be for example the feedback from a uh, adversarial classifiers you know or some other type of uh, you know uh, you know mechanisms and the, in this case you can re recover a couple of uh, different vanilla, uh, different variations of the gun model such as the f model f gun the watson stan gun and so forth so by now I'm going to stop enumerating more examples. The truth is that uh, most of the known algorithms published in the machine learning you know, literature can be instantiated you know, uh, using the standard equation by introducing a specific form of experience, the divergence you know, or the uncertainty function. So this is like the standard equation is like a tree that unifies most of the known you know, machine learning paradigms and the formalisms in a very, very neat fashion without you taking the effort to, you know, re-derive the equation or to understand the full anatomy behind those designs. And this is such a, just a, you know, a, you know a, a, a table that shows you very explicitly how these different experience functions, divergence functions and so on look like when recovering all these different forms of equations or different and uh, no machine learning paradigms. Well, you may ask, uh, are we exhausting all the known machine learning models already in this standard equation? Well, the answer is, just, is that not quite. We still have a, a few you know, mechanisms and paradigms not fully studied yet. And uh, here are some examples such as meta learning, lifelong learning, but uh, uh, that actually uh, belongs to our future work. We want to understand whether uh, how far we can push the standard equation to cover existing and future machine learning paradigms. So what's the big kind of a benefit for achieving such a, a more unified and uh, standardized formulation across different machine learning models? Well, there are a lot of benefits I'm going to elaborate, but I want to name one before I move on to the next uh, bullet item in the blueprint. The obvious outcome is that you can now do, do what we call the pen learning, panoramic learning, that is learning with all experiences. Because as I mentioned, a human being, you know, every day is living in an environment where all experiences come to you at the same time, right? And uh, in machine learning, we used to develop algorithms one at a time for different experiences. But with the standard equation, you can now using uh, use very this very simple additive form to do weighted combinations of experiences of different types, such as you can combine experiences from data, from rule, you know, from rewards and from interaction and to create a, you know, a, a kind of a monster that uh, you know, can benefit from a, a combination of uh, different experiences. And I will have a few examples about what kind of additional you know, a benefit you achieve you know, in doing so. Well, I mentioned that the blueprint you know, uh, you know, uh, includes the loss, but also you know, uh, leads to you know, uh, the need to come up with uh, optimization solvers you know, and uh, uh, model architectures. Here, I want to uh, save time uh, by, you know, uh, staying at a very high level because once you have this, uh, you know, uh, standard equation written explicitly, it makes life easier for you to think about a holistic uh, solver, you know, for different uh, machine learning problems. For example, I mentioned about, uh, you know, this alternating gradient idea which can be instantiated into different forms of EM, variational EM and so forth. I think that's a very promising algorithm that could be you know, a leading to you know, a more universal solver, which looks like this, right? Basically the alternating gradient will leads you to you know, a, you know, a, 
you know, a alternating uh, formulation that uh, iterates between these two steps. You know, in the you know in this step, which uh, we could call it a generalized E step, you basically are combining experience with uh, previous uh, version of uh, the target model, and uh, then update this uh, new version of the auxiliary model. This is often known as the teacher. The teacher basically needs to you know, understand the students and also learn new knowledge and then combine them together to basically get fully loaded. And then in the you know, generalized M step, we're going to connect the teacher to the students using a loss function, in this case, across entropy, but it could be other form to really uh, you know, bring the student's level of knowledge equal to the level of knowledge to the teacher. So this is a kind of a, you know, a more generalized teacher-student mechanism that is behind what uh, many EM style algorithms is doing. And we believe that uh, this particular mechanism could be you know, a uh, generic solver for many of the machine learning problems. There are some advanced ideas which I want to skip for just for the interest time, such as uh, bringing in the kernel trick under this formalism to allow nonlinear interactions between experiences, and such as uh, using the differential, uh, the probabilistic functional descent to uh, you know, have even you know, more kind of turnkey solutions, even algorithmically and uh, symbolically on different problems. But for the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details. Another space of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, you know, uh, blueprint is uh, the model architecture. Again, this is a space that probably has received the most attention in recent research. People have been working very hard to bring in systematic solutions to model architectures to the point that we have uh, now huge libraries of uh, neural network designs, graphic model designs, and uh, their compositions. So here are just some uh, high level kind of uh, coverage of what the design look like, right? For example, if you want to design neural networks, you can go with a large library of uh, ideas to starting from uh, activation functions, gate functions and uh, layers, you know, of all kinds to process different data. And then you can, you know, uh, you know uh, use uh, all these uh, different uh, neural network components built on those uh, building blocks to build, uh, you know, encoders, decoders, you know, uh, attention models, transformers, and so forth. And uh, you know, the graphic model also allows you to uh, model, you know, causal structures between random variables and the uh, composition of uh, neural network components using the graphic model ideas allows you to build even more advanced compounded models, such as encoder decoder schemes, you know, encoder decoders with, uh, you know, prior knowledges, with the uh, memories and with feedbacks or multi-head attention models and so forth. Right. Again, so I think, uh, you know, once we have uh, a systematic way of uh, writing down the standard equation as the loss, then you can plug in existing ideas of uh, all different model architecture design and maybe even a, uh, uh, a uh, master solver, uh, you know, on the algorithmic side to come up with a very compositional solutions. So that's basically comes to the summary of a uh, blueprint of machine learning. I introduced this uh, standard equation, which uh, covers a wide spectrum of uh, needs from different uh, machine learning model and the training paradigm. And then on top of that, you have the potential to extend the EM algorithm you know, to solve all different type of uh, uh, learning problems with a, sing a single uh, uh, family of technique. And then you can make use of uh, all different model architectures, you know, to achieve compositionality. Now let me show you a few uh, use cases, uh, you know, uh, resultant, you know, from, uh, you know, this uh, new formulation of uh, learning with all experiences uh, and the potential, uh, you know, uh, freedom of uh, exploiting complex interactions between experiences and so forth. So one of the first benefit under the standard equation is that you now can uh, better leverage existing uh, developments you know, uh, in the literature to solve new problems without reinventing the wheel. So 
Specifically, we can reuse or repurpose originally specialized algorithms to solve new problems. And here are some examples. For example, we all know that uh, you know, a, you know uh, this uh, very well-known algorithm known as the you know policy gradient, you know uh, you know was uh, widely used in reinforcement learning, right, to learn models based on rewards. But uh, you know we have uh, some other you know uh, you know learning paradigm such as the posterior regularization, where uh, we have uh, unsolved challenges. You know, posterior regulation, for example, is the problem of, uh, you know, uh, using, uh, say, rules, okay, to constrain, you know, a posterior distribution under the learning setting. But uh, say in applications like uh, healthcare, you have this uh, uh, medical uh, knowledge graph that presents you thousands, if not tens of thousands of rules. Not all of them may be useful in regulating this potential function, uh, this, uh, this uh, loss function. So which rules are useful, which rules are not useful? There hasn't been really a very good paradigm for learning rules, right? Because, uh, you know, the posterior, uh, the, the, the posterior regularization paradigm, you know, is not providing you the right vehicle of uh, parameterizing rules and the furthermore learn the weights of that. But this problem has been solved you know, in the paradigm of reinforcement learning, because in reinforcement learning, every action come with a reward and the reward can be a parameterized function. And then we use, uh, you, know, uh, you know, inverse reinforcement learning to learn, you know, uh, such uh, parameters in the rewards to achieve, uh, you know, the learning outcome. Now, how about we re reuse this, uh, you know, uh, you know the, re the inverse RL algorithm, you know, in the, posterior regularization to you know, allow the rules to be parameterized. And then you know, uh, use the, this RL algorithm to learn the weights of the rules, right? So that basically is uh, you know, a, a very trivial repurposing of previous known algorithm into a new task, just by exploiting the uniform expression of uh, both problems under the same standard equation. Example two, uh, in another paradigm, uh, when we, for example, uh, learn, uh, you know, in a fully supervised maximum likelihood setting, you know, you are given all data. Say, you know, you uh, appreciate, you know, some data points more than others because uh, they are more trustworthy or they are more informative. Then how can we direct attentions to more valuable data more than the less valuable data. Again, in MLE, such a mechanism doesn't exist. You have to, you know, uh, redefine the problem. For example, you can, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, superimpose an active learning paradigm where you pretend all the given data, you know, are resampled from some oracle to make them into active learning. This is a pretty kind of a complex, you know, uh, new development that requires some substantial experience you know, in algorithm and model design. But now we know that in reinforcement learning, again, there are mechanisms, you know, based on policy gradient that allows you to learn both extrinsic and the intrinsic reward function. And the, the reward function associated with the intrinsic rewards actually is allowing every experience, okay, or every action to be also parameterized and weighted. If you build connections of uh, every action to every data points, you can imagine that every data points can also be attributed with uh, a weight function. And then you can pretty much use uh, this, uh, you know, intrinsic reward learning mechanism in RL, you know, to learn data weights, you know, pretty much under the same standard equation formulas. Uh, and another example, you know, before I stop, uh, is to redeploy some of the a uh, well-known algorithmic trick for uh, algorithm stability to some challenging reading, re uh, learning problems where uh, algorithms are extremely unstable, right? You know, for people who play with the gun learning, okay, you know, especially in the computer vision domain, you probably know that gun models are extremely unstable and very hard to train. They can basically be tipping off the cliff just by a slight change of the parameters in your updates, right? And this problem actually has been dealt with 
you know, in reinforced learning because they face the same stability problem, you know, in their domain. But uh, uh, their learning environment is very different from GAN because there, you know, the setup is to have a interacting agent or a uh, interacting environment giving you rewards and so forth. Yeah, but the algorithm, you know, remain, you know, uh, pretty universal. They developed uh, something known as the, you know, proximal policy optimization and also important sampling algorithms and so forth to stabilize, you know, a uh, original trivial gradient algorithm. And now by rewriting the GAN model, you know, uh, under the standard equation and the build direct connection between the GAN learning and the reinforcement learning or maximum likelihood learning of variational inferences, you can actually just repurpose all these uh, stabilizing algorithm in other domains to the GAN training paradigm. And here are some examples showing you the proximal policy optimization helps to create this, uh, you know, nicely shaped, you know, uh, uh, surrogate loss that allows a trade-off, you know, of uh, your steps versus the gain over your loss function. And in our original, you know, conventional loss function, you actually have, uh, you know, a monotonic kind of uh, uh, trend you know, that you can only basically, you know, go uh, increase or decrease without uh, having the ability to work in them back to become more stable, right? And likewise, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, variational inference uh, technique where we use the importance weighting of the sample, you can see that uh, the GAN model can be, you know, uh, much better stabilized compared to a vanilla GAN training algorithms. Again, so these are existing algorithms uh, successful in some domain, now successfully deployed it in new domains, thanks to the, you know, the connection, you know, enabled by the standard equation. So another type of uh, game is to enable learning with all experiences, which I mentioned earlier, right? Now I want to show you two examples of uh, precisely what game you get. We know that uh, in uh, language generation, you know, uh, we, probably want to make use of uh, multiple experiences because uh, when you generate, uh, when you build a conversational system, you know, uh, or maybe build a, uh, you know, a uh, uh, AI writer system, you need to get a number of things right, right? You need to get uh, the linguistic part of the language correct. You need to also get a sentiment right because uh, it reflects very often, you know, a uh, emotional state, you know, in the conversation. And also you need to get the content right and so forth. And all these actually are based on different type of experiences. For example, you need to use my linguistic rules to uh, really, uh, you know, dictate certain, you know, uh, you know, uh, language quality. And your language model also will help improve language quality. And then your sentiment classifier will make sure that you have the right sentiment. So now we can build a uh, compounded integrative experience function that combines experiences from all these resources. And then at the end of the day, you will have a controlled sentiment and also uh, language content in your generative model. Right? If you are interested, you can look at these papers to see how exactly they were built and validated. The other example may be even more intuitive. Uh, suppose that you are building an app okay, for virtual try on. I, I believe this is a, a interesting tool that, uh, you know, especially in the COVID uh, uh, setting, you know, people cannot walk into a physical store to uh, try a uh, dress, for example. How can you still, you know, enable a good shopping experience? Well, you can build a virtual try on that uh, when you click a particular dress, uh, the app will put it, you know, to yourself in the picture and then make you, you know, directly, you know, looking at, uh, uh, what you look like, you know, in a particular dress. But the virtual trial is a very difficult program because, uh, you know, uh, you, many users, you know, natural users want to see the dress from different angles in different poses, you know, to just uh, get the, uh, the full body experience, right? But uh, we all know that uh, uh, this type of uh, generative model is very hard to train because uh, the volume of data is very small because, uh, you know, you are, you know, a, a particular type of individual of a particular body build, and then your gesture, you know, can all come from a different angles. And then for every angle of the gesture and for every individual, you don't really have a lot of images to train, right? 
So how can we mitigate this problem? Well, you can actually combine now multiple experiences. One source is really just the data experiences, you know, uh, by say images of large volume for a particular gesture or a post angle. But then you also can combine, you know, uh, uh, rules of, uh, you know, uh, dictating body parts. For example, we know that, uh, you know, our heads are on our shoulder and uh, we have uh, the body and uh, the limbs positioned in a certain way. And uh, rather than train such a kind of a relationship, you know, on the model, we can directly specify such relationship on the model, which uh, are in the form of a different target pose. And you can basically write an arbitrary kind of a, a pose a composition you like, and then let them to be part of uh, the training paradigm. And then you know you are going to combine these you know rule-based experiences with the data experience and train the model. And here are some interesting illustration of uh, the incremental effects once you have uh, more and more experiences. So the base model is purely based on training data, and you can you know you can imagine you know, for a new post that is not seen before, you know you get uh, misplacements or awkward kind of outcomes. If uh, you only train with a uh, fixed knowledge. Uh, uh, with a hard combination, your knowledge sometimes uh, can be overfit, you know, uh, and uh, your missing knowledge uh, can be failed to get extrapolated. Therefore, you still have a low quality production. Right? But uh, if you allow, you know, learned knowledge, you know, you remember we have a technique before for learning the rules, you know, in a soft way and together with your data, you now can achieve a better, you know, trade off between you know, data and the rule and the other information and start to generate uh, more meaningful kind of try on experiences. Okay. And uh, this type of compositionality actually uh, is now uh, already, you know, of uh, substantial, you know, uh, needs. And uh, you know, many teams are working on, you know, operationalizing compositionality using the standard equation or many other paradigms. So my own team, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the United States and to be also built in here is working on a few projects toward this. One of the projects is known as Texa, which allows you to build natural language functions using building blocks like this. So this is what the Texa toolbox look like, right? It's basically, you know, a, uh, you know, a uh, catalog, you know, of uh, all different loss functions, architectures and the machine learning building blocks. In fact, uh, we are thinking about, uh, you know, carrying out a few text uh, tutorials, you know, uh, you know, in our university, uh, especially for the uh, the beginning graduate students, so that you can start uh, building solutions and the learning machine learning models not from scratch, from from this uh, library of tools in a much more comfortable and productive fashion. And in fact, uh, it allows you to also go quite advanced beyond just compositionality, you can actually, you know, leverage on different uh, training ideas, such as uh, rotating between maximum likelihood, you know, uh, reinforcement learning on blue scores or adversarial learning on challengers, you know, to train a uh, more robust and more versatile model using the, the, the text uh, toolboxes. The text uh, gives you, you know, a, a good API that allows you to uh, just plug in different uh, training paradigms and the training functions just by calling different uh, appropriate functions. So this is actually leading to a topic that I'm going to talk about uh, in my future talks, which is this uh, industrialization you know, of AI. You know, AI you know, in you know, uh, its future incarnation, I believe won't be you know, as artistic and as mysterious as we are seeing now. It's probably going to be more uh, intuitive and more standardized that's what we see in electric engineering and in chemical engineering, where you build, you know, a big machine by, you know, uh, building different parts and assemble them in large quantity and in a highly standardized and repetitive fashion. So that's basically where we are heading toward the industrialized AI. We have, uh, in fact, uh, in my group, uh, the following topics intensively studied. Today, I talked only about the first principle, a blueprint of uh, programmatic machine learning. But uh, if I have opportunity in the future, 
we can talk more about uh, how to enable composition of machine learning by building, you know, pan ML programs, you know, from Legos, you know, with the uh, building blocks. We can also, we also study how to automatically tune models by doing, you know, hyperparameter search and the uh, neural, uh, and, and uh, uh, neural architecture search and so forth in an automatic fashion. We also study the problem of uh, scaling up machine learning models, how to train, for example, gigantic machine models in a computer cluster, you know, in a parallel fashion and without, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, computational, uh, uh, excessive computational overhead and also ex excessive uh, uh, time delays and so forth. So uh, what we're heading toward is a, a more kind of a, a holistic view of uh, looking at machine learning problems, which uh, uh, is summarized as a castle, namely composable, composable automatic and scalable machine learning. And I use this uh, uh, umbrella to unify many of the research activities that we are pursuing these days, you know, in the space of uh, making composable models, making automatic tuning mach machineries, and making scalable uh, computational operating system and infrastructures. And this is actually the, the code, uh, GitHub uh, code basis that is already published. And I actually uh, would encourage uh, you guys, engineers or researchers, to take advantage of uh, this uh, GitHub library to uh, either uh, you know, add additional tools or make use of these codes to build uh, the solutions that they're looking for. Okay, so now I'm coming to the end. Uh, so where are we heading toward? You know, uh, uh, from the theory side, you know, I, was, uh, I have been very excited about uh, building standard equations and unifying different uh, aspects of machine learning. But uh, uh, people who are asking, you know, where this uh, line of work uh, is taking us to, you know, from at least a, a theoretical perspective. Honestly, I don't really know. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the dream or the vision from the physicist are usually a very beautiful one. For example, here, Phil Anderson, one of the Nobel laureates, you know, uh, uh, claimed that the physics is the study of symmetry. And at the end of the day, we may be seeing the grand unification of physics you know, following these uh, footsteps from Maxwell equation to theory of relativity to the Mills Young standard models, and maybe toward the end, you know, for a theory of everything, you know, and unifying all the phenomena we see in a single equation. Uh, is this going to happen in machine learning? Uh, or are we going to see a master algorithm that basically like our human brain, a single brain, you know, solving all problems uh, honestly, I don't know, and that is actually not necessarily my goal. Okay, our goal, you know, toward uh, through this work is to really, you know, uh, provide maybe a, a, a methodological uh, kind of uh, idea that enables a unified way of thinking through a diverse spectrum of machine problems, so that we demystify, you know, the current maze of uh, machine learning and the current black box of machine learning so that uh, we can make it uh, a little bit easier for us to understand and to reproduce and to even further innovate. So that requires a systematic understanding of all the equations, which uh, I hope the standard equation is helping to make easier. And also we can hopefully think about uh, someday a automated solution creation from the Legos and the building blocks that we are building. And eventually, you know, we can improve accessibility and the interability of a machine learning, you know, in all aspects. So I'm way over my allocated time, but uh, I'd like to uh, come to an end to the presentation and uh, thank you so much for the attention and now I'm ready to take some questions. Here are the papers uh, relevant to the materials I just talked about, if you're interested. Okay, great. Thanks uh, for pro Professor Eric for the talk and any question from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Professor Eric. Uh, it was a nice talk. I mean, 
you talk a lot about the standardization of the tools or the toolkit, right? But uh, still the problem of taking this toolkit and applying it for a particular solution, so the automated solution creation part, still there's a lot of uh, artistic uh, things involved in that process. Um, so don't, uh, how do you think that can be solved um, by using this kind of toolbox? I, let me try to understand the problem better. Uh, first of all, I would say that the tools are not quite there yet. And uh, where there exists a good tool, at least the, the, art, the need for artistic uh, uh, manipulation can be reduced, right? That's actually the goal. Because uh, if you look at uh, current uh, aviation and other industry, uh, there are less arts and the more engineering, right? So what we are doing right now in defining this tool is first of all, there is uh, you know, a, uh, a uh, uh, standardized design you know, of the interface where you bring in data and where you, you know, uh, deliver the output. But also there is a standardized way of uh, dividing you know, the building blocks. You know, I presented very explicitly you know, the whole learning problem to be divided into the plug-in of different experience functions. And you can imagine a library of uh, a thousand or a few hundred different experiences. Each can be explicitly covered by a particular equation. And then there is also this uh, space of a loss fun of divergence functions and uncertainty functions. So the way I see future machine learning implementation is to come up with a standardized equation of these components rather than a implementation of the whole thing, which is end to end and becoming artistic. So if you look at a text, for example, if you are willing to spend some time to play with text, you will see that there are very little arts involved. You literally need to just uh, identify the right components, like whatever you know, electrician would do to identify the right wear. That's part, I don't think it's art. It is a, a, you know, a practice. And then you assemble them based on the manual or in our case, the API or the program interface that is provided. Right. And then people, so for, yeah. For example, let's say I take one problem in computer vision, right? For mm -hmm. this, some particular type of divergence function, some particular type of uh, experience, and some specific uh, uncertainty function might be helpful. But if I take a different problem, let's say uh, even in computer vision or something else, I need completely different sets of experience functions, um, divergence functions, and so on. So, and there is still art involved in designing these divergence functions or the experience functions. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. You know, uh, uh, I'm not saying that uh, all is covered, but uh, I think uh, efforts already has started not only from uh, my research team, but also elsewhere. You probably know that Facebook has this uh, uh, collection called, uh, not Facebook, Perceptron, right? Uh, not Perceptron, uh, Detectron, right? Detectron is one of these examples that uh, you build a library, you know, of, uh, you know, object recognizers or, 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 or transformers that is uh, pre-trained already toward a particular type of thing. And then if you happen to be you know, working on the similar type of contents, you don't have to retrain them, right? And uh, imagine that now we are going beyond just uh, the detection, but also you know, uh, different types of uh, co-attentions and uh, different types of uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, image to language kind of uh, translations and representations. Yeah, so this uh, library is uh, now uh, being built and uh, we actually are welcoming in fact, uh, you know, such concerted effort even from our team here to contribute to these libraries. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I have uh, also a question about the framework. Uh, for instance, if I have uh, maybe multi-agent, uh, uh, environment, how would you imagine one can extend this framework to take into account uh, multiple agent interacting? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. I was uh, trying to convince uh, one of my students to work on. I think uh, one of the advantage in a uh, standard equation is exactly this uh, multi-agent environment where say you have uh, two agents, you know, playing each other or coexisting, then, you know, uh, when you train an agent, uh, you have to take into account not just the, the data experiences that a particular agent have, 
but also the impacts coming from the other agents. Therefore, you need to have one more antenna to receive experience, right? So mm -hmm. to me, that amounts to defining a particular F function that is uh, receiving, you know, any impacts from the other. For example, uh, I would say uh, if, uh, uh, for example, two people, you know, are going to the same restaurant, okay? And uh, in the trying to uh, book uh, uh, their reservations, you know, if I'm assuming that the universe has only myself uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the rest are irrelevant, then, you know, uh, my recommendation system would recommend me that particular uh, restaurant and on that particular dish. But if I imagine that there are other five, you know, patrons, you know, also looking for foods, and uh, then I would, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, augment, you know, my loss function, you know, to include, you know, uh, experiences from another five or some number of users in terms of uh, what if they choose the same restaurant, then mm -hmm. how my chance of uh, getting that seat gets uh, affected and so forth, right? So uh, that actually, when you put all this together, that leads to a very interesting co-training paradigm, which uh, captures not only the additive kind of loss, you know, uh, in a uh, independent way from every individual, but also this uh, pairwise or group interaction loss that is uh, due to the, you know, the, the, the experiences, you know, from the environment. I don't know exactly how that can be, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, grounded to a specific setting yet, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we are trying to now look into that with uh, some of the initial designs. Thank you. Great. So actually, I have a follow-up question related to these aspects. So the scenario you describe uh, for recommendation is more like a collaborative scenario between the multi-agents, but there may be competitive kind of a scenario of gameplay, you know, uh, a zero-sum type of a scenario. Yeah. And. Uh, it's more complex, I imagine that. Um, would you imagine that, that the framework can be also extend along that direction? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. in fact, uh, I, I think that's where uh, we will see even further advantage, right? Remember, uh, the GAN framework is not already unified under the standard equation by defining the experience function to be a adversary classifier. So in that sense, you know, you are, you already can take into account the adversary experiences from a opponent. In this mm -hmm. case, of course, the opponent is itself. Basically, the model itself has a a, a, a D component. Uh, but uh, if you have a multi-agent setting, you can basically uh, impose one standard equation for each agent, and then you know uh, the standard equation for every agent, you know, could naturally, you know. Uh, you know, uh, define, you know, the proper divergence loss, right? Uh, reflecting the gun type of uh, dynamics and also the appropriate uh, experience function that explicitly model whether, you know, it is a classification adversary experiences or reward, you know, adversary experiences and other kinds. Right? So in a sense, of course there are arts. If you run into a new area that is never, you know, experienced before, you need to redesign the loss function, uh, redesign the fit, the, the experience function. Yeah. But uh, I suppose the design space becomes now significantly reduced because, uh, you know, uh, the other kind of uh, elements, for example, additional experiences are already taken care of. Then, you know, divergence loss is already taken care of. The uncertain loss is taken care of. And then the operating drop driver, which is usually an alternating algorithm is also taken care of. So you need to basically plug in a very small piece that is open-ended. So I'm hoping in the future, this is the way that uh, ML can evolve, that whenever you run into a new problem or new setup, you only pay attention to the delta, which is the difference, but uh, then reuse and leverage on what is existing already. Therefore, you build uh, incremental agents rather than in the, in nowadays, for example, when you build a new agent, you have to start from scratch and rebuild everything. So in that case, I hope, you know, it's like more like human being. Human are very incremental learning. You know, every time you learn something, it, stick, it sticks to you. And then you'll go with, uh, you know, one more piece of experiences. So I hope the standard equation is at least the providing a mathematical foundation, you know, for enabling that without needing to redefine the whole loss function and the whole algorithmic framework. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, so I have a question. So, uh, so in, in the slide, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, and uh, for the meta learning, I, I heard that this is the next work. Actually, so, uh, from my view, uh, that is very uh, similar to the uh, hyper, hyper, hyper parameter turning. So, because for the hyper parameter turning, uh, actually, this is a bi level problem. So, mm -hmm. so, I think the standard equation can be treated as a single level optimization problem. So, in the hyper parameter are turning, so we can maybe based on the standard equation, so we can maybe extend the current framework to be the bi level. Uh, framework. So in that case, maybe we not only to solve the high parameter optimization problems, we can also solve the meta learning or like the similar bi level problems. So this is my my view. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I appreciate that thought. I, that, that, yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, promising. You know, uh, following what you are just saying, maybe we can imagine that uh, right now in the standard equation. There are two kind of uh, free norms, right? One is uh, the Q, the auxiliary distribution, which is the teacher function. And the other is the theta, which is uh, kind of the model parameters. In fact, there is also a phi, which is the, uh, the, the experience parameters. <laughs> In a sense, you, you, you have another set of uh, parameters only associated with uh, the parameterized experiences. I can certainly imagine that uh, you introduce the additional layer of uh, auxiliary functions, and uh, then also the parameters thereof. Would that be closer to what you're saying to be the matter layer, where you, you can call them hyperparameters, you can call them, you know, uh, uh, what do we call them? We call them uh, 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 in the HPO, we call them uh, acquisition functions and acquisition distributions, right? Yes. Yeah. So that yeah, I, I, yeah. I I I I love to look see people. You know, uh, you know, maybe uh, paying attention to that and uh, bring some uh, unified uh, view. You know, to un to 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 to, to uh, maybe tie together all these different efforts. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Yes, please. So. Um, I have a question. Thank you, Eric, for the fantastic presentation. I have to say, I think this is the best presentation I have attended in the last 10 years. Thank so you. thank you for the also uh, this initiative about the uh, a theoretical framework for the uh, AI, if you want to say it, and how you take in like different perspective, cast them in, in one framework. This is this is fantastic. Uh, I have a few questions. The first question I have I feel we are in engineering and industrial application, we are behind compared with the computer science. And I have to say that artificial intelligence engineering, or if you want to call it industrial application, is still there is a gap between what algorithmic being developed in, in, in computer science and what we are deploying as solutions to the, to the industry. And it's good for us to put our hands why we are like this. So is it in our research? Is it in our teaching in both? In our also maybe lack of certain aspects in our researchers they don't have? Is it due to the different platform for AIs starting from TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, all of these things, Tixar now for, I think Tixar is for text generation platform for as an open source, uh, like machine learning type things. So do we have also unified programming platform to let engineers to work from? Because we are maybe most of us, we are not good, good in commanding or programming. So we, we try to, to master one thing rather than to know 10 things. Mm -hmm. Is this, for example, what we have to focus on? This is number one. Number two, uh, I would like you also touch base for more maybe for simulation to reality transfer, how this is will bring our uh, like model theta uh, in a generalized form in order to serve our application uh, and also to adapt with different conditions and maybe also sometimes unknown conditions. 
So mm -hmm. uh, these things, what I would like you to touch base. And thank you again for the fantastic presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, yeah. Uh, I appreciate uh, you know uh, your acknowledgement of uh, the interest of this talk. Uh, but of course, I, I also admit that uh, I wasn't really well prepared. I, I was in other meetings even one hour ago, so my mind wasn't completely clear yet. So, uh, but uh, I'm happy that you, you got some of the key points in the talk and uh, your question was a very nice one. In fact, uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to give another talk uh, titled uh, by Product Production AI and the Industrialization of AI. Hopefully in that talk, uh, we will be able to share more insights and uh, views about uh, uh, what might be the right uh, direction for a uh, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, applicable, more practical AI platforms and uh, what are the open props in there. I think uh, the, the, the fact that you raised, uh, the, the, the issue you raised, like we are you know, engineering in AI is lagging behind uh, is a uh, issue due to uh, many, many, uh, you know, uh, sources, including the way AI is now being taught, uh, AI uh, solution is being produced, and also uh, whether the right question is asked, you know, for AI uh, researcher and also in engineering world. So I will touch upon some of these problems in my, in my, in my next talk. And hopefully, you know, we can also have time to discuss uh, what might be uh, the right platform uh, that uh, serves the needs that you just mentioned. In fact, uh, one of my dreams uh, is to uh, build this very platform here at MBZUAI with uh, the input and the uh, involvement of uh, faculty and students here because we actually do have a prototypic platform you know, uh, in the making that covers both the, the machine learning composition and also the meta learning for model optimization and also the automatic deployments and the serving of models in computer infrastructure. But again, this is a very, very kind of a gigantic undertaking that requires a uh, open community to contribute. So I'd be happy to discuss those potentials and problems. On your second problem of uh, uh, having the opportunity to simulate and, uh, and, uh, and uh, connects better to reality. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally, in agreement with that. I think uh, with the arrival you know, of uh, some standardized platform or even a part of that down the road so that uh, uh, certain machine learning and AI function become table stake you know, for every people to play with. Uh, I believe uh, you know, uh, people will be uh, feeling more empowered to uh, try on different experiences. For example, you know, under the standard equation, you know, what I show today is more about how it recovers existing algorithms just by instantiating uh, the experience or the divergence to a certain way. But the, the more interesting question is indeed to plug in, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, you know, fancy or uh, creative, cra crazy or uh, peculiar, uh, strange kind of experiences, and see what that leads to. You know, they, maybe uh, there is, for example, how, what will happen if I non-linearly, you know, combine, you know, the reward experience with uh, a set of rule experiences plus some adversary and using a kernel function to kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, combine them, you know, in a, uh, you know, higher order fashion. Nobody knows what's going to happen, right? So I think uh, having the platform and uh, such a uh, uh, clean and a simple, uh, unifying framework at least makes uh, uh, the, the the thought experiment easy. You can think about such thing can happen, and then even make the implementation happen because uh, we do provide certain driver algorithms and a certain conversationality built on these models. Yeah. So I hope you know the work is of course, you know, raising uh, more about raising questions than solving questions, right? So, uh, but uh, uh, I, I'm 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 hoping that uh, with this talk. Uh, we could together, you know, look into some of the instances, like you mentioned, and uh, and see what's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other final question? Yeah, actually, I have a question. Go ahead. 
my name is Nimshan. Thank you, Professor Eric, for this great talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I want to take advantage of you being here and get your opinion. Yal um, Kun has repeated in recent talks that there are many issues with supervised learning methods. One is it doesn't supervised learning doesn't scale, and uh, um, he says the future of AI is unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I mean this is like. Uh stating you know i mean I, I, i'm i'm in full agreement with what he said but uh i, I think uh, it doesn't uh have to be uh that because uh, Yan said it and then uh we have to listen you know in fact i don't think the future of machine learning relies on any particular form of learning it has to be a combination uh you know when you have data you use it when you have label you use it but when you don't have you, you use other forms as i said in the you know, standard equation formalism, unsupervised learning is uh, a particular instance of designing your experiences, right? Where the experience does not involve, you know, a fully labeled kind of uh, reward or a, 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 or a, a game, you know, uh, when seeing a data examples. Uh, I would say, I would, uh, instead of making big claims about uh, the, where the future lies in a particular type of experience, I would, uh, probably uh, bet more on, first of all, how to inclusively looking into all experiences without uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, promoting or marginalizing a particular one. And secondly, I would uh, even be more excited in uh, answer the question about uh, how to make those uh, learning you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, happening computationally more efficiently and uh, aggressively more efficiently because uh, the, the how part is what uh, you know drives the research. Uh, uh, I I don't feel too strongly to uh, focus only on. For example, in fact, uh, in another talk, he also stated that uh, the self-supervised learning is another important direction. I think these are all just uh, major statements about uh, you know previously maybe uh, under. Uh, appreciated uh, areas needing more attention and more effort, but uh, uh, as uh, you know, a uh, you know, uh, you know, a student or as uh, a uh, researcher, uh, I would say you know, all problems that solves a real need is uh, is important. You know, you don't have to make a strong judgment about which one is hotter and which one is less hot. Okay. Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eric. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk and the interaction with the audience. Um, um, I think uh, we already had a long session for today's seminar, and um, hopefully we will also have more of such talk in future and seminar and discussion. Um, finally, let's just thank Professor Eric again, and then this concludes today's seminar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all the uh, attention and the interest. You know, I, I think this uh, is also meant to be, you know, uh, you know, uh, setting up uh, uh, our uh, kind of uh, enthusiasm for, you know, doing, you know, uh, exchanges, you know, uh, within our community to uh, really give uh, frequent talks like this, so that we can understand each other's work and then try to build collaborations. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you, everyone. Okay, bye. Thank you, Mike.